1947, the British government surrenders its mandate in Palestine. Ernest Bevin, British Foreign Secretary. We have decided that we are unable to impose a solution of our own. The only course now open to us is to submit the problem to the judgment of the United Nations. All British troops will be withdrawn by the middle of 1948, but not before further bloodshed. Michael Lang. Riots in Jerusalem, burning of Jewish shops, possible to see smoke from my window. Curfew now imposed in Arab areas. The Jews say they will be able to protect a new state and maintain order. The Arabs say to us, we have no argument with you. Go home, Inglesi, and we will push the Jews into the sea. What does the future hold? It looks bleak indeed. 14th of May, 1948. The new state of Israel is proclaimed under the leadership of Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion. The new Jewish state is immediately convulsed by war with its own Arab population and its Arab neighbors, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Within six months, Israel's galvanized citizen army is victorious on all fronts. Over 6,000 Israelis die. Combined Arab losses total more than 15,000. Seven hundred thousand Palestinian Arabs flee the new state of Israel. Sabia Abu Latifa. We wanted to flee before the Jews would recognize us. We were afraid they would shoot us. We only took a few clothes. We didn't think we'd go forever. The Israeli army marches in victory. Britain's 30-year rule in the Holy Land has come to an ignominious end. Richard Meinertshagen. The British government has abandoned Palestine, same as in India. We have had to slink out, despised by all. We have left behind a hatred that will not die for generations. It is a glaring admission of failure, unprecedented in the history of our empire. For a hundred years, the British Empire in Africa had attracted adventurers and dreamers to its vast wilderness. Errol Whittle settled in East Africa after the Second World War. Life in England may have become a highly organized business, but Africa never changes. With each day there comes some new enchantment which grips the imagination. Vast plains with lakes and mountains and always the sky's unresting clouds sifting the sunlight across the hills and valleys. For many, the British Empire in Africa is an opportunity to teach, 
and to heal. Sister Mary Ignatius, Uganda, 1954. Our life in Africa is very humble. We cherish the simplicities of life. We don't need much more. The joy we find, which makes our work so worthwhile, is brought by the children. They have so little, so few opportunities, and then to be struck by blindness, it's tragic. As well as medicine and education, the British also bring Christianity. A Scottish missionary in Uganda in the 1950s, Gordon Robertson. The heathen races of Africa are lost souls. They suffer because they have not heard the word of the Lord Jesus. The gospel is the only means by which they can be saved. Thousands of teachers, doctors and missionaries devote their lives to serving the empire. It's sick and illiterate and it's supposed lost souls. The rolling hills of the Abadair Mountains in Kenya are a home from home for many British settlers. They become known as the White Highlands. But they are also the home of the Kikuyu tribe. Gushu Gekoyo is a Kikuyu farmer. I often ask myself why the British send their children all the way from home to a land that is not theirs. I have come to the conclusion that the white man is a thief by nature. Cherry Lander, a widow who runs her own farm on the foothills of Mount Elgon, is a coffee pioneer. There would never have been any Kenya if there hadn't been settlers tough enough to endure the first awful years. They have given Kenya their youth, knowing that they could make nothing of it in their short lifespan. But they were building a future for their children and their children's children. Gushu Gekoyo becomes a follower of Jomo Kenyatta the leader of the Kenya African Union, who is campaigning for independence. At a meeting in Theka, Kenyatta asked us whether we want to fight for our land. We replied, yes. Are you waiting then until the white man has bred into this country like rabbits? No, we replied, we want to fight now then realize that the tree of freedom is red, not with water, but with blood. Kenyatta becomes the figurehead for Kenya's nationalism, but behind him, a much more radical movement emerges, Mau Mau. Nineteen fifty one. The King's African Rifles patrol the thick forests of the White Highlands as Kikuyu resentment at the occupation of their land escalates into armed rebellion. The rebels express their loyalty to the cause through a blood ritual, the Mau Mau Oath. Gruesome stories about the oath-taking ceremony are so potent that British filmmakers recreate them as propaganda. But Mau Mau's sympathizer, Josiah Karaoke, recalls the fearsome words of his own oath. I will obey all orders of the Mau Mau, or this oath will kill me. If I'm cold in the night and I refuse to come, this oath will kill me. If I'm told to bring in the head of a white man and I refuse, this oath will kill me. 